Michael Crichton, you have the next statement. Before I begin, I want to just say one brief thing about what Richard has just told you. He's, he's given you the story of plate tectonics, but it's fascinating. He's turned it upside down. He's turned it on its head. The story of plate tectonics actually is the story of one person who had the right idea, Alfred Wegener, and he had it in 1912. And it is the story of major scientists at Harvard and elsewhere opposing him for decade after decade until finally it was proven to be incorrect, what they were believing. So it is, in fact, when I was a kid, I was told the continents didn't move. It is, in fact, perfectly possible for the consensus of scientists to be wrong, and it is, in fact, perfectly possible for small numbers of people to be in opposition, and they will ultimately be proven true. I want to address the issue of crisis in a somewhat different way. Does it really matter if we have a crisis at all? I mean, haven't we actually raised temperatures so much that we, as stewards of the planet, have to act? These are the questions that friends of mine ask as they're getting on board their private jets to fly to their second and third homes. <laughs> and I would like, with their permission, to take the question just a little bit more seriously. I myself, uh, just a few years ago, held the kinds of views that I expect most of you in this room hold. That's to say, I had a very conventional view about the environment. I thought it was going to help. I thought human beings were responsible. And I thought we had to do something about it. I hadn't actually looked at any environmental issues in detail, but I held that general view. And so in 2000, when I read an article that suggested that the evidence for global warming might not be quite as firm as people said, I immediately dismissed it. Not believing global warming, that's ridiculous. How could you have such an idea? Are you going to try and tell me that the planet isn't getting warmer? I know it's getting warmer. I grew up in Long Island, and when I was a kid, we always had days off from school for hurricanes. There are no hurricanes in Long Island now. I spent 30 years in California. We used to have something called June gloom. Now it's more like May, June, July, August gloom with September, October, November gloom added in. The weather is very different. However, because I looked for trouble, um, I went at a certain point and started looking at the temperature records. And I was very surprised at what I found. The first thing that I discovered, which Dick has already told you, is that the increase in temperature so far over the last 100 years is on the order of 6 tenths of a degree Celsius, about a degree Fahrenheit. I hadn't really thought when we talked about global warming about how much global warming really was taking place. Second thing I discovered was that everything is a concern about the future, and the future is defined by models. The models tell us that human beings are the cause of the warming, that human beings producing all the CO2 are what's actually driving the climate warming that we're seeing now. But I was interested to see that the models, as far as I could tell, were not really reliable. That is to say, their past estimates have proven incorrect. Uh, in 1988, when James Hansen talked to the Congress and said that global warming had finally arrived, the New York Times published a model result that suggested that in the next 100 years, there would be 12 degrees Celsius increase. A few years later, the increase was estimated to be 6 degrees, then 4 degrees. The most recent UN estimate is 3 degrees. Will it continue to go down? I expect so. Now, this left me in a kind of a funny position. But let me first be clear about exactly what I'm saying. Is the globe warming? Yes. Is the greenhouse effect real? Yes. Is carbon dioxide a greenhouse gas and it being increased by men? Yes. Would we expect this warming to have an effect? Yes. Do human beings in general affect the climate? Yes. But none of that answers the core question of whether or not carbon dioxide is the contemporary driver for the warming we're seeing. And as far as I could tell, scientists had, had postulated that, but they hadn't demonstrated it. So I'm kind of stranded here. I've got half a degree of warming, models that I don't think are reliable. And how am I going to think about the future? I reasoned in this way. If we're going to have one degree increase, maybe if, if climate doesn't change and if, uh, and if there's no change in technology, but of course, if you don't imagine there'll be a change in technology in the next 100 years, you're a very unusual person. <laughs> And I also was aware that we have actually been starting to do exactly the kind of thing that we ought to do, which is to decarbonize. Jesse Osabel at Rockefeller University points out, for example, that starting about 150 years ago, 
in the time of Abraham Lincoln and Queen Victoria, we began to move from wood to coal, from coal to oil, from oil to natural gas, and so on. Decreasing our carbon, increasing our hydrogen, makes perfect sense, makes environmental sense, makes political sense, makes geopolitical sense, and we'll continue to do it without any legislation, without any, anything forcing us to do it, as nothing forces to get off horses. Well, if this is the situation, I suddenly think about my friends, you know, getting on their private jets, and I think, well, you know, maybe they have the right idea. Maybe all that we have to do is mouth a few platitudes, show a good, you know, expression of concern on our faces, buy a Prius, drive it around for a while, and give it to the maid, attend a few fundraisers, and you're done. Because actually, all anybody really wants to do is talk about it. They don't actually do anything. And the evidence for that is the number of major leaders in climate who clearly have no intention of changing their lifestyle, reducing their own consumption, or getting off private jets themselves. If they're not willing to do it, why should anybody else? Is talking enough? I mean, is, is the talking cure of the environment didn't work in psychology, won't work in the environment either? Is that enough to do? I don't think so. I think it's totally inadequate. Every day, 30,000 people on this planet die of the diseases of poverty. There are a third of the planet doesn't have electricity. We have a billion people with no clean water. We have half a billion people going to bed hungry every night. Do we care about this? It seems that we don't. It seems that we would rather look 100 years into the future than pay attention to what's going on now. I think that's unacceptable. I think that's really a disgrace. One. This doesn't need to happen. We're allowing it to happen. And I don't know what's wrong with the rich, self-centered societies that we live in in the West, that we are not paying attention to the conditions of the wider world. And it does seem to me that if we use arguments about the environment to turn our back on the sick and the dying of our shared world, and that's our excuse to ignore them, then we have done a true and terrible thing. And it's awful. Thank you. <laughs>